He was a family man with a love for the outdoors. There's deer all the time, turkeys, raccoons. There's a lot of wildlife in our neighborhood. He especially liked the deer. He built a custom feeder, and that's where he kept the corn. Until his disgruntled neighbor decided to put an end to his hobby. Back home, there's dead corn. And when it's one dead animal, it's easy to think it's a coincidence, but it didn't stop there. And when their feud ends in bloodshed, investigators must determine who's to blame. It wasn't something that was happening over the course of a couple months. These guys had been at it for years. It's the Hatfields versus the McCoys, and it was just one of those perfect storms. May 5th, 2014. It's a quiet Monday evening in the picturesque town of New Brighton, Minnesota. Sean Bortell and his wife are tucking their children into bed. But at 8.32 p.m., their domestic routine is shattered by the sounds of gunfire. It was boom, 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 boom. And I froze. And it's not uncommon to hear fireworks or things like that in the neighborhood. And my wife immediately said, those are gunshots, call the police. 911, where's your emergency? I think somebody just fired a gun near our house, like four shots. While the operator takes the Bortel's information, a much more urgent call comes in. 911, where's your emergency? Oh, shooting us, What needs an ambulance? I'm getting shot, yes! On the phone is 48-year-old Jennifer Clevin. She says she and her boyfriend, 46-year-old Todd Stevens, were outside their house when a gunman opened fire. She ran inside, injured and bleeding, and she picked up the phone, called 911. Can you tell me if the man that did this is still there? He me shooting through my house. I'm scared to go near the window. Okay, Jennifer, we have a lot of help on the way, okay? We get here now. Her longtime partner had been shot. She didn't know if he was still alive. I can only imagine how frightened and upset she was. Police and paramedics quickly arrived to find Todd Stevens lying on the ground, unresponsive. They have to get in there and keep themselves safe, assess the situation, determine if there's an active shooter. Even if the shooting itself is over, who did it, where did it come from? Todd Stevens was a longtime resident of New Brighton. In fact, he was raised on the same block where he and Jennifer now lived. The neighborhood is pretty small. Everyone's very close. Um, there's older families, younger families with kids. Like, I have people who have lived there their whole lives. Todd and I had talked quite a bit about his history in the neighborhood. He grew up in the house that, that we had purchased. He had moved into the house that he had while his parents lived next door to him for some time. The couple had first met 18 years before in 1996. Jennifer was a single mom with a young son. She just moved from Texas to Minnesota, and Todd was a short-haul truck driver. They hit it off pretty quickly. Todd was good with Jennifer's son, Ryan, so when the relationship grew more serious, they moved in to Todd's house. They hadn't gotten married yet, but they weren't any less of a family. Jennifer described their life together as wonderful. Todd was an avid outdoorsman and often took Jennifer and Ryan camping, but they didn't have to go very far to enjoy the wilderness. New Brighton is a wooded area near several lakes and preserves. We have Rice Creek right across the street from my home. There's deer all the time, turkeys, raccoons. It's just, there's a lot of wildlife in our neighborhood and that's part of what makes the neighborhood great. Todd liked having all the animals around, but he especially liked the deer. He built a custom deer feeder where he kept it full of corn. I definitely saw more deer, partly because they used our yard to walk to, to, to get to the corn. My kids thought it was cool. In addition to his deer feeder, Todd was also well known for his outgoing personality. 
He was incredibly friendly. He loved his beer. He actually seemed more friendly after having a number of beers, but not once had I seen Todd irate. According to most people, Todd and Jennifer appeared to be ordinary neighbors. Todd was incredibly helpful. Uh, one of my daughters had a flat tire. He helped out with that. We had a swing set. Todd came over and, and brought tools and helped out with that. So in general, it was a typically positive neighborly relationship. But now Todd is bleeding to death after being gunned down outside his home. When first responders got there, some helped Jennifer while others went to Todd to administer CPR. The whole time, they don't know if they have an active shooter situation and it is very tense. While officers try to secure the area, another call comes in. 911 emergency. emergency. Someone's shot. What's your name? You'll find out. Coming up. Minnesota police find themselves in a standoff with the gunman. It's quite surprising for the shooter to call 911. In New Brighton, Minnesota, police and paramedics have descended upon the home of Todd Stevens and Jennifer Clevin, both victims of an unexplained shooting. My wife and I heard Jennifer scream. We were really afraid. We didn't know if there were people loose in the neighborhood. Who were these people? Who did the shooting? While first responders try to administer first aid, 911 operators are fielding another call about the attack. All right, do you All the police police shot him? are there. I'm not going to shoot the police or anything. I'm sorry, what? I said, I'm not going to shoot the police. The police are already here. They can go help the guy. Even though the caller won't tell them who he is, it's pretty clear through the context that they are talking to the gunman. So they try to keep him on the line and try to keep him talking. Who is nobody, the guy that's nobody, outside? Todd Stevens. Nobody listens to me around here. I told the guys that he's going to shoot us. He's got guns. He's got guns, and uh, I, I, I've had, I just had enough. Okay. Are you planning on doing something to yourself? No. Are you willing to let the police come in? Not the New Brighton police. He wasn't going to surrender to the New Brighton police because he thought they were a bunch of, quote, kooks. Neil said he already spoke to police earlier that day and told them about the threats that Todd made against him, but they ignored him. Todd was telling the neighbors that he was going to shoot you? He was going to shoot me, yeah. Can I ask what your name is? For Neil Zumberg. 57-year-old Neil Zumberg lives across the street from Todd and Jennifer, and he's currently holed up in his house with a gun. It wasn't just a random attack in a random neighborhood. There was one suspect with a gun who had a target. For the next half hour, you have a 911 dispatcher on the phone with him, and outside, you have a police commander trying to talk him down. By the end of it, you had law enforcement from multiple jurisdictions outside of his home ready for anything. Where is the gun that's in the house right now? I just want to make sure officers know so that it doesn't endanger you. Well, you don't care about me. I care. We don't want anything to happen to you. But you don't care about me. I know you don't. But just as officers are preparing to storm the house, there's a breakthrough. A dispatcher coordinates with the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department and somehow gets Neil to agree to give himself up then to sheriff's deputies instead of the local police. In the end, he just stepped out of his house with his hands up and went outside quietly. While Neil is taken in for questioning, investigators begin to process the crime scene. From Todd and Jennifer's wounds and the damage to the house, it looked like a shotgun was used in the attack. The house was struck several times by pellets. And they also entered uh, the residence and were lodged in the living room of the house. Uh, the front door, the screen door, the glass was shattered. 
Outside the corner of the house, they found four spent shotgun shells. They mark all the shells and they have to take all their photographs. The shooter was 125 feet away um, across the street. A search of Neil's house turns up three possible weapons. Neil Zumberg had three long guns. Uh, those were from his father. One was a shotgun, one was a deer rifle. I think there might have been another shotgun as well. One of the shotguns, a Browning 12-gauge semi-automatic shotgun, was found in the Zumberg's basement on a chair. Neil's fingerprints were found on the gun and the shells were a match. But what caused the bad blood between these two neighbors in the first place? As investigators speak to the other local residents, they begin to get a clearer picture. It was just a normal day. I was outside um, in my backyard with my dogs. I knew right away that it was gunshots, and it was an odd sound for our neighborhood. So immediately I thought of Todd and Neil. It seemed like that's the direction where it was coming from. This was not the first time that these two families had gotten into it with each other. His wife, Paula, also locked horns with Todd's girlfriend, Jennifer, as well. In fact, Paula Zumberg had been spotted fleeing the area just after the shooting occurred. My wife had looked outside to see Paula near the edge of her lawn, looking across the street at Todd's house, going to her car and then driving away. It turned out that Paula and Jennifer were also overheard having a loud argument earlier that day, so police had to wonder if that also played a part. As the police investigation begins to unfold, they're sort of discovering that there's this feud that, that's playing into what had happened. It wasn't something that just happened over the course of a week. It wasn't something that was happening over the course of a couple months. These guys had been at it for years. What kind of feud could have led to this level of violence? From an outsider's perspective, it was hard to know who had said what, which threats had actually been made, who was actually afraid. Um, I think things had just gotten blown so out of proportion. Coming up, a double shooting becomes a murder investigation. Everyone was just very confused and shocked and surprised. Six-year-old Todd Stevens and his girlfriend, Jennifer Clevin, have both been shot by their neighbor. Unfortunately, Todd's wounds proved to be fatal. Todd had also been hit several times with a shotgun blast, so he had wounds to his head, to his chest, to his abdomen, and his extremities. He bled to death before they could do much for him. Jennifer is luckier. Thankfully, her injuries weren't as serious. She was hit twice with the buckshot. One of the pellets went through the right side of her abdomen and the other her left. While doctors tend to Jennifer's wounds, investigators ask her to help them figure out how the shooting occurred. She had a first row seat as a witness to what happened. She was a victim of the shooting and she was, you know, a part of this feud for all those years. But the first thing they had to do was break the bad news to Jennifer. It's hard to imagine to lose your boyfriend of 20 years, but then to also be an eyewitness to his murder. Is Todd dead? I'm sorry, he has passed away. This I hurt. Don't know my life now. Oh. I don't know my life. Jennifer says they lived across the street from the Zumbergs for over 17 years. And at first, the two families got along well. Todd and Jennifer were in the neighborhood first. The Zumbergs bought their home, I believe, in 1998. Neil was a physical therapist, and his wife Paula also worked in healthcare. They had two boys and a girl. The Zumbergs would come to Todd Stevens' house and have cookouts and what have you. One of the Zumberg sons, Jacob, even became best friends with Jennifer's son, Ryan. He was raised in the house with my son. I love Jake. 
Over the years, however, Jennifer says Neil became increasingly hostile towards them. For what seemed to be nothing more than a simple disagreement. Todd's deer feeder was directly in his front yard. So next, again, next to our house. And of course, in plain sight of Neil's yard. Mr. Zumberg did not like the victim and his girlfriend feeding the deer. He didn't uh, like that because the deer would come into the yards, pass through his property. Zumberg tried to argue that feeding the deer was illegal, but the truth was, he didn't like having them around. He just saw them as pests. It's not illegal to feed wildlife, especially deer. You're just using corn. But Neil decided he was going to put a stop to it anyway. According to Jennifer, around 2012, Neil Zumberg started a campaign of retaliation and of harassment to make them stop feeding the deer. When intimidation didn't work, Jennifer says Neil went after the source of the problem. My deer feeder came up If they weren't going to listen to reason, Neil just figured he'd destroy the damn thing. But Todd wasn't the type of person to just let that go. Good old Todd, he got some PVC pipe and poured some concrete in the ground and put a new one in there. There were multiple deer feeders, I think, that were broken. I don't think it was just one incident. Then, as the skirmish continued, a mysterious letter was delivered. Everyone in the neighborhood got a letter in their mailbox the same day. It was a Xerox copy. When we moved in, we received a letter, and I believe the letter initially sent was anonymous, uh, although hand-scrawled with a prescription for Neil on there, so referred to as the Mr. Corn letter, because Mr. Zumberg referred to Todd as Mr. Corn because he would feed the deer with corn. The letter accused Todd of endangering the health and well-being of the entire neighborhood. Deer can carry ticks that cause Lyme disease in humans. And in page two of the letter is a copy of the prescription that Neil's doctors gave him to treat it. Neil Zumberg felt that he got Lyme disease because of the deer coming through his yard, going to Todd Stevens' house to feed on the corn. He was very angry about it. This went way beyond a dispute between two households. I mean, to try and get all your neighbors involved, that's throwing fuel on a fire. But that wasn't enough for Neil Zumberg. He sent a copy of the letter to the local newspapers who ran it. Probably a human interest story as much as a potential health risk. I mean, it sounded a little bit crazy. I mean, quite honestly, it seemed somewhat humorous because of just the nature of the dynamics. Of course, we had no idea that it would lead to something serious. Coming up, the neighborhood feud takes a darker turn. If they'll go so far as to drop a dead animal in your yard, what else will they do? Hours after a neighborhood shooting left Todd Stevens dead, Minnesota police have the gunman in custody. According to Todd's girlfriend, Jennifer, they were targeted by their neighbor across the street, Neil Zumberg, because he didn't like them feeding the wild deer. Jennifer tells police the feud had been brewing for almost 10 years. And in 2012, Neil took his campaign of harassment to a new and disturbing level. I go home. There's death rolling. And when it's one dead animal, it's easy to think it's a coincidence but it didn't stop there. Soon, there were all kinds of dead animals showing up in the yard. Dead bird, a deer light. Two weeks later, another deer light. She apparently got fed up with it and decided to go to local law enforcement. Jennifer was afraid. She petitioned the court for an order for protection and they granted it. However, a court order wouldn't prevent another incident from occurring in December of 2012. It was winter, and there were two dead deer in Todd's lawn. We were just walking out to take our girls to the bus stop, and traumatic sight for them to see. Todd was already outside, Jennifer was outside. They 
clearly were frustrated, understandably so. Can you imagine waking up and finding dead animals in your backyard? I mean, we have dogs, and sometimes we'll find little critters in the yard, easily explainable. But random animals in your yard, that's, that's a whole different level. That's designed to scare you. Police got involved and, and tried to figure out maybe who placed them there. Todd certainly thought Neil did it. Neil denied that. So a lot of indirect anger was placed towards each other. Jennifer says when they confronted Neil, he threatened to kill them too. There was a sort of a, a gradual escalation of things. You know, it went from veiled threats that stemmed from frustration out of their feud uh, that went to threats of violence. You walk on and say, I'm going to kill you. After that, Todd and Jennifer decided to install security cameras outside their house. They were tired of the arguments and the police coming. They put cameras up and they faced those cameras to the Zumberg residence. Once the security cameras went up, there were no more dead animals found in the yard, so that's telling. But still, the threats continued. By the spring of 2014, tensions had reached an all-time high. And that led to another confrontation with Neil's son, Jake. There was a run-in at the Spring Lake Park VFW where Jennifer and Todd were playing bingo. And the Zumberg son, Jacob, was there and approached the couple. Jennifer said he'd been drinking and accused them of giving his father Lyme disease. He was so angry and so aggressive that management kicked him out. He said, I'm going to kill y'all and bring your house down. They were legitimately afraid and called police. Jacob was gone by the time they got there, but uh, cops said, call us if you see him again. And he was charged um, with making terroristic threats. So the police already had Neil Zumberg in custody, but it makes you think, did the son have something to do with it and his father was just covering it up? A week later, on May 5th, Jennifer ran into Jake again. She had gone to pick up food at a local takeout place, and as she was leaving, Jacob came in. Knowing that he had essentially gone off the grid for the last week and that the police wanted her to let them know she called the cops. Jake was arrested at the restaurant, and when Jake's mom, Paula, got wind of it, she was really angry at Jennifer. That was the straw that broke the camel's back on this kind of a Hatfield to McCoy situation. When Jennifer got home, uh, about 8.30 p.m., Paula was right there and walked outside to confront her. Jennifer tried to defuse it, or at least open it up to an actual conversation. But according to Jennifer, Paula wasn't interested in talking. She's like, oh, I'll kill you myself. There's no telling how far that altercation might have gone if Todd did not step in. Jennifer said that when Todd came outside that he didn't say a word, he just came out silently and stood next to her. For a moment, it seemed the situation had been diffused. Then, the first shots rang out. Neil Zumberg suddenly came from around the corner of the house and started blasting them with the shotgun without any warning. When she saw Todd going down, and I think just sort of looked up and, and realized that Neil was over there with a gun, and then she scrambled inside to, to call 911. The bullets are going through my front door! And Paul up and saying, shoot, 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 shoot. He was adding him on to shoot. It's a harrowing story, and one that seems to fit the evidence gathered so far. But when detectives speak to Neil Zumberg, the story he tells is very different from anything they've heard so far. Coming up, was it murder or an act of self-defense? He threatened to kill me, my wife, my kids. He said, I just had enough.
After surrendering to police, 57-year-old Neil Zumberg has been taken to the New Brighton Police Department for questioning in the murder of Todd Stevens. We'd like to talk to you about what happened tonight, kind of what spurred you on, what happened with the argument. Do you feel like you can tell us the story? I probably should. It's up to you. We'd like to hear from you, because we don't know. There wasn't a whole lot of question that Neil had been the gunman. I mean, he called police. He surrendered. They just needed to secure the physical evidence to sort of corroborate his story. Neil agrees with only two things Jennifer told police. What started the feud and what caused it to escalate. This is all about deer, basically. New Brighton police won't do nothing. These people made our lives miserable and then they just... Didn't, didn't do anything about it. Like Jennifer, he says the relationship between their two families started out good. But when Todd built that deer feeder, Neil's life became a nightmare. There was one deer, and then it turned into five deer, and then ten deer, and then freaking twenty deer, and then our whole lives turned into deer. And I just wanted them to stop feeding the deer. The Zumberg family would observe the deer coming through because their property abutted a railroad track, I believe, in some woods. So the deer would come out uh, from that area across the Zumberg backyard. Neil says he first tried putting up a fence to block the deer, but Todd retaliated. Todd got really pissed off because he cut the, the fence that, that's on, on the trail that goes along our, along our property okay. so the deer can get through there easier. A little while after that, Neil says that he contracted Lyme disease. And the only logical reason seemed to be all the wild deer. He tried to warn his neighbors with the letter, but the Jennifer started to falsely accuse him with ridiculous accusations like leaving deer parts on his lawn. It was his lies. They just wanted me to quit complaining about the deer. And the new right police says, we just want you to stop. Just stop. We don't care what's right or wrong. This one cop told me to stop it, you know. So they're like, well, no, I'm not going to stop it. I got Lyme disease. Neil says his illness, as well as the court order Todd and Jennifer had placed against him, affected his ability to work. And things only got worse. Todd liked to work out in his garage, so he always had, like, um, a bench press bar and would kind of blare the music and be like lifting weights in the driveway. And it was always super loud and kind of like way hyper masculine. He also said that Todd was loud at parties at his house and shooting his guns. That one be a good neighbor. We just moved in and he was all boom, boom, shooting his 30 30 up in the air. So it just went on and on. I mean, with, with uh, them getting drunk and. and, and just making our lives miserable. Officers had been called before, sometimes for the dispute between the neighbors, uh, and sometimes to respond to domestic events over at Todd and Jennifer's house. Police records appear to support Neil's claims. And Neil says that after he filed his complaints, Todd turned his violent aggression toward him. He would get pissed off just because I complained about the deer. Mm -hmm. We'd make threats, and they always instigate the According to Neil, his son Jake didn't start the confrontation at the park. Todd did. It was Todd that was trying to pick a fight with them. He's done the same thing with my son Nick, threatened him, threatened to kill me. Neil says it all came to a head the night of the shooting, after his son Nick called to tell them Jennifer had Jake arrested. She went out, uh, I saw him pull up, and she goes, I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind. My wife went out. I said, no, just stay in the house. Next thing you know, they're swearing back and forth, and, and I came out. He apparently grabbed the shotgun in case things got out of hand because he knew that Todd and Jennifer had guns at the house. Neil said that he actually got that gun prepped a week before the actual shooting, loaded it. Uh, showed his wife how to use it and stuck it under a couch in the living room in fear that things would escalate. So he comes from around the side of the house trying to keep out of sight. According to Neil, he's not planning on doing anything. He's just there just in case. 
and I was watching, uh, making sure that they weren't going to shoot my wife or something. And it uh, just happened, man. Neil claimed that he saw Todd saying something threatening toward Paula, something to the effect of, I'm going to kill her, fill in the blanks with some expletives. You know, he carries a gun and stuff, and they're screaming and yelling, and well, he had his arms like this, and then he kind of went down like this, and, and I just, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he was armed. That's when Neil opened fire. His wife was in danger, so he just pulled the trigger, and with all the adrenaline going, he just kept on shooting until it was over. What made today different? I don't know, just everything. All that put together? Fear, my wife's crying, she can't sleep at night. Fear of getting shot. Neil didn't come across as a cold-blooded killer in the interview. Near the end, he even asked how Todd and Jennifer were doing. They hadn't told him yet. Hopefully, he's all right. I got the feeling he's not. Um, how about her? Huh? He's never been an uh, intended target of anything. But whether or not Neil intended to kill anyone, the fact remained that Todd was dead. The day after his surrender, Neil is charged with second-degree murder and attempted murder. As for Neil's wife, Paula, police tracked her down at her mother's house. But when they brought her in for questioning, she lawyered up. She wasn't saying anything. Prosecutors try to reach a plea agreement, but Neil refuses. So on May 8th, Paula Zumberg is also charged with aiding and abetting her husband's crimes. Coming up, two warring families face off in court. This wasn't self-defense or a crime of passion. He planned to kill Todd Stevens. Like I said, it's the Hatfields versus the McCoys. Neil and Paula Zumberg have both been charged in the murder of their neighbor, Todd Stevens. Prosecutors believe the shooting was motivated by a long-standing feud between the two families. While Neil Zumberg pulled the trigger, his wife Paula is charged with aiding and abetting the murder. The allegation was that she was urging her husband to shoot. Paula goes on trial first in August of 2014, three months after Todd's death. Instead of trying her case in front of a jury, Paula's attorney pushed for a bench trial, which means the case would solely be decided by the judge. It was a strategic move. Mrs. Zumberg would not do well in front of a jury. She's a very caustic individual. She's prickly. The jury would not accept her very well. Todd's girlfriend, Jennifer Clevin, is the prosecution's star witness. She told the same story she told police, but unfortunately, the testimony didn't play as well with the judge. She initially claimed that Paula was egging him on. That was not corroborated by anybody else. Neighbors had opened their windows or got out on their stoop to listen, and they never heard Mrs. Zumberg say, shoot, shoot the gun, shoot him. Paula's attorney did not even have to call witnesses. He argued that the state did not prove its case against Paula, And the judge ultimately agreed. Paula Zumberg is acquitted. A year later, in August 2015, Neil's trial gets underway. His charges have been upgraded to first-degree murder. The first-degree premeditated murder is the highest level charge in Minnesota, and it carries an automatic life without parole sentence. The state says Neil's actions in the week before the shooting did prove that this was not a case of self-defense or a crime of passion. He planned to kill Todd Stevens. Had his gun ready, loaded under the couch. It had previously been in his basement, unloaded. He exited the window, took up a sniper position, and fired the weapon when there was no danger to himself or his wife. And that videotape is quite important. The footage is grainy, but chilling. It shows Paula coming out of her house and getting into a shouting match with Jennifer. 
In the background, Neil could be seen peeking five times before firing his shotgun. The jury also hears damning statements made by Neil during his interrogation with police. They should give me a, a medal here because we have the, the, the police were going over there all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Because of this domestic stuff. It actually sounds like he's actually bragging about killing Todd. There's no remorse there at all. It's going to be used by the prosecution to build their case, again, to show that, that this was intentional. It pointed to a guy with a plan, you know, that he wanted this guy gone and that he was willing to take it that far. In a surprising move, Neil Zumberg decides to testify in his own defense and tell the jury his side of the story. He reiterated that self-defense claim that he thought that Todd had a gun and was going to go for it and was going to use it to kill Paula. In Neil's mind, he was fearful of Todd Stevens and what Todd Stevens could do to his family. He believed in his heart of hearts that his wife was in danger and pulled the trigger. But as the prosecution points out, there's a glaring problem with Neil's story. Todd didn't have a gun on him. He had a cell phone in a holster or a, a case. Talk is not.